I want the old man himself. Murdoch Lancer puts $50,000 in my lap or I'll eat this little pitcher down a well. You got that, Boston? Huh? Yeah. All right, messenger boy. Deliver my message. Give me evil, sexy Hamlet. Settle in duet. Enjoy it. <laughs> and cut! Oh, boy. I didn't, I didn't hurt you there, Mary, but with that throw, did I? No, 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 no. I'm good. I got pads on. <laughs> and I always throw myself on the floor, just for fun, even when I'm not getting paid. <laughs> now, Quentin, you know, we see Hollywood regurgitate so many public domain fairy tales, revisionist fairy tales. Now in this film, I notice, and Django and Inglorious, you've woven, are you a guy who just basically weaves your own fairy tales and you basically take some of the most loathsome events in American history and just basically fix them? In those three instances, I don't know if that was necessarily the, the start, starting point, all right? Um, but it definitely has become the ending point, all right? Uh, in, all, uh, in all three of them. To me, what's more interesting about the question is, yeah, because there's, the, there's those interesting historic events. I mean, one of the things, like, somebody asked, I think somebody asked me on the going around on this one, they were like, okay, well, you're setting up this horrible historical event and you're changing it. Well, uh, isn't that you repeating yourself? You know, uh, is that creatively bankrupt? And my response was, well, not when I do it, it's not. <laughs> Y'all can't fucking do it, because <laughs> you're taking it from me, but I can do it fucking every year if I wanted to. It's mine, I created it. <laughs> I, I never would have thought to answer, ask the question that way. <laughs> Big man, not at all. Now, and you know, this is an industry crowd. And there's a lot of things in this movie, and I've watched it three times, that resonate. The, the, you know, the, the actor who feels his career slipping away, the stuntman who didn't really have that much of a career and is a little okay with it, you know, things changing. Yeah. What parts of this movie and Inside Hollywood do you hear the most about from people in the business? I think there's universal truths to Hollywood as as an industry and Hollywood as a town. That even though, you know, 60s Hollywood is different from 50s Hollywood, is different from 70s Hollywood, is different from 80s Hollywood. So every decade, it's different. There's a different patina to it. There's a different personality. But at the same time, uh, the industry itself kind of remains the same even though it seemingly changes. Um, so I think there's universal truths to it that people recognize and, uh, and, and and attached to. I mean, like for instance, just even the even the whole concept, frankly, to tell you the truth, what, what I actually find I think the people that bring people bring up the most to me that has a resonance now is the whole concept, what's never really been a hundred percent dealt with in a movie before, of a longtime actor and his longtime stunt double. So I've like a bunch of like, oh wow, have you ever worked with Jeff Bridges? He has a guy like that. And you know, you know that guy. If you know Jeff, you know that guy, you know? And and you know, Harrison Ford has a guy like that. And a lot of a lot of fellows have a guy like that. And it was from seeing an older actor that had a guy like that that gave me the idea to write um a Rick and Cliff. Um but whatever is universal kind of almost happened by accident because I really tried to make it very 1969 specific, you know, dealing with the death of, 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 uh, of TV Westerns, which was, uh, but not only just, but it was, to me, it was more important. Yeah, there's the death of TV Westerns. That's a big deal. And it's just the death of TV Westerns, the birth of the cop show is all it was. And they were basically cop shows anyway. But... <clears throat> To me, what was really, really uh, uh, era-specific fascinating was the idea that a whole group of leading men, and yeah, lead, absolutely, leading white men, that's what you're dealing with in the 50s and the 60s, uh, 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 leading men who went to uh, uh, create a career for themselves, they did it either through movies or they did it through TV show, and the way they did it was running pocket combs through their pompadours and, and kind of being he-man. Yeah. 
and looking like the handsome He-Man. Everybody was trying to get on on a uh, on a Western show. I, uh, you know, Bruce Dern is in the movie. You know, he's from that era, and he said that. Uh, now, we all know that Bruce Dern guessed it as like a prairie rat scum on all those shows. Sometimes like, uh, you know, uh, he's big on, on Big Valley five times and then Bonanza three times. But the point being, though, is like he said that like there was a period of time where him and Jack Nicholson would have traded their left nut to be Robert Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get be a regular, be a regular on on the Virginian. All right, we get on Laramie. All right, I'm just just to be Robert Fuller would be the thing. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but the thing is though, all of a sudden the counterculture hits. It hits in a big way in '67, and by '69 the counterculture is the culture. And now all of a sudden, all these guys who've been sold a bill of goods of to be likable, and I'm going, why would anyone want to watch you? Or why would anyone want you to be in their living room if they don't like you? So that was their whole thing. Uh, all of a sudden, now, that type of leading man is gone. <laughs> Anybody who puts real cream in their hair or wild root cream oil is gone. And now the leading men of the day are long-haired, androgynous, skinny, long-haired, androgynous, shaggy hair types. You know, so like, you know, uh, so George Maharis is out and Michael Sarazan is in, <laughs> you know? And, like, yeah, and, and, and with the exception of like Christopher Jones and Michael Sarazan, almost everybody is the hippie son of a once famous guy. <laughs> so Michael Douglas is son of Kurt Douglas, Robert Walker Jr., son of Robert Walker, David Carradine, son of John Carradine, fucking even Arlo Guthrie, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Peter Fonda. <clears throat> Quentin's got, he's got a, 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 a bunch of actors kind of going around LA and living their lives. And one of the most touching is Sharon Tate, who Quentin, you said, you didn't want her to just be defined by tragedy. You wanted people to understand who she was and what she was capable and what was robbed of her. But Ariane, give me an idea of, of, of what was most helpful to your research in capturing the dress of that day from the Hollywood types like Al Pacino's character to that hippie culture to Sharon and Roman Polanski. Um, even, even, you know, as it, as it was almost like, it was almost like an upstairs downstairs as to, as to people in Hollywood and how they behaved and how they dressed. Well, first of all, this was like the, a costume designer's biggest fantasy, right? You have real life events and at the center of real life events, you have a fictional storyline, which is like using both muscles as a costume designer. So super juicy. And, you know, Quentin's script, I had never read one of Quentin's scripts before. Um, and it was like, it is incredibly richly layered. The characters are so well defined. And it's just like operating on a higher level. So for me, uh, it was, uh, you know, it's like, where do we start with cutting the pie, really? Well, we started with uh, Rick and Cliff. Uh, because they're the heart of the story. And then this wonderful ability to, uh, in terms of character study, of the, the story that supports them, the story that we know from, you know, Roman and Sharon to Bruce Lee to Steve McQueen to the Mansons. So it was um, fantastic. I mean, you know, doing biographical research, I've done biopics before, and of course, lots of, of fictional narratives. So it was the mashup of both. And I think, you know, for me it was really exciting because first of all, I, it's like a bucket list to be able to do a Western with Quentin. So I got to do a couple <laughs> Westerns. So that was like beyond for me and to have to be part of the, be part of contemporary Hollywood and being, it's almost like an honor I feel like to be able to tell the story of like how we got to where we are today. And being able to show the change of what was happening in 1969, I really felt like it reflected a lot of 2019 in terms of how our culture is switching digitally. Not that we love it all the time with streaming and everything, but, but how we can, you know, costume is character study, it's identity, and being able to tell that story without dialogue visually along with the amazing Barbara Ling production design and Bob Richardson cinematography to be able to imagine, I always try and imagine if there's no dialogue, 
if the audience can you know, understand who these people are. Now, Quentin, I read that you are going to become a father for the first time. That's very true. Yep, congratulations. My wife is pregnant as now, we speak. I went through this three times, <laughs> and all we did was watch those Disney musicals. My prediction is that after you've sang that damn Frozen song for the 40,000th <laughs> time, you're going you're gonna to say, Mike Fleming was right. I do have another five films in me. <laughs> yeah. You won't retire. How about that? <laughs> I'm a Tangled guy, so I'm gonna really try to steer her away from Frozen onto Tangled, all right? But it's the same group of people, so they should be okay with it. <laughs> I love it. All right, thank you very much for thank you. listening.